And all God's people said? Amen. 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 It's so good to see you guys here. I'm excited about uh, the Word. If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 14 through 18. And if you are using one of our Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you'll find Philippians 2 on page 1,165. And as always, if you don't have a copy of God's Word that you can read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. Write your name in it, make it your own, read it and apply it to your life. And you're going to discover as you read and apply God's Word, He will bring life change to you. You'll experience a change, transform life if you apply His Word to your life. We want to welcome our Parker campus. We're so glad you're joining us today. And if you don't have a Bible, you can jump up right now in Alumni Hall, run back to the middle of the room, grab a cup of coffee and a cookie and grab a Bible and make your way back. Go ahead. We'll wait for you now. There you go. Thank you, sir. We are, uh, as we continue, as we uh, continue to look at this series, we have to remember the context of this letter. This was uh, the first time we think that Paul had been arrested and imprisoned for sharing his faith. He was under house arrest. Paul was the, uh, the guru, the church guru. He was the main church pastor, the church leader. He was the apostle that everybody talked about everywhere he went. Churches sprang up. People gave their lives to Jesus. And now the leader of their faith had been arrested and was under house arrest. And we don't know for how long. He didn't know for how long, but he was chained to the walls. And as Paul was in prison, he spent some time reflecting on his own life. He spent time thinking about his life, processing his life. And I believe that as he wrote to the, the Philippians, as he wrote to the Philippian believers, he challenged them to also think about and consider how they're living for Jesus. As you follow along in the Bible translation, I'm gonna be using the New Living Translation. Uh, our, our Bibles underneath the seat in front of you are ESV. You're welcome to use that. Just know you'll get lost if you're trying to follow along with me. I'm using the uh, New Living Translation, Philippians chapter two, beginning at verse 14. Paul writes, do everything without complaining and arguing. Should we stop there? Verse 15, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share that joy. Now you see Paul's reflecting and he's thinking about his life in this moment and he's wondering maybe he's going to die, maybe he's not. And if he is going to die, he's saying, hey, my life is being poured out like an offering, but I don't want it to be pointless. I want my life to matter. And it's going to matter, he says, if you do these things that I'm telling you to do. In this passage of scripture, Paul gives four simple instructions for followers of Jesus to apply to your life, uh, to our lives. And this first idea that I wanna point out to you is found in Philippians 2, verse 15. As you look at verse 15, Paul said, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. And if you're able to underline in your Bible right now, I want you to just underline the part. It might say shining like bright stars. It might say uh, uh, shining bright like, uh, like light, bright, bright lights. Shining like stars, whatever it says in the area of illuminating, underline that portion. God created you to shine like a star. 
God created you to shine like a star. Tonight, I want you to drive outside the city limits. I want you to get out past the city lights. I want you to take a look and gaze up into the sky and look at all the stars that you see. And the only reason why those stars are shining so bright is because the black is so the sky is so black. The sky is dark and that's why we are able to see those lights. A star shines because of the darkness around it, and you were created to shine in a world that is corrupted and filled with sin. Have you ever noticed that people around you sometimes use foul language? Have you ever noticed that people around you sometimes brag about an affair or brag about cheating on their spouse or, or they, they boast about their possessions and they talk about all their money? Have you ever noticed that people get very prideful around you? Not you, but people, people, other people. They act mean sometimes and they're cruel and sometimes they're just hard to get along with. Have you ever noticed that? God has placed you right smack dab in the middle of this dark world to shine like a star and to point other people to Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Shining like bright stars, as he says in verse 15, in a world filled with crooked and perverse people. God wants you to shine and attract other people to point them to Jesus. Now, this, this reference to light is not just metaphorical, okay? Paul's not just grabbing for this metaphor and, and using it. He's not just grabbing this and saying, yeah, you're shiny and raccoons are going to like to play with you, right? And he's not throwing this out there. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When you do good works, you are shining the light of Jesus. Your good works in the middle of a dark world, in the middle of a selfish world, points people to Jesus. They get blown away. I can't believe that you're serving in that capacity. I can't believe that you're serving in our schools or serving in this children's ministry or that you're out uh, in Havasu picking up trash on the side of the road. Why are you doing that? Good works shine like stars. So people will see your good works and good glory to heaven. Paul also wrote this in Ephesians 5, 8. He said, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. There is a light that is within you. It is from the Lord. See, the moment that you became a follower of Jesus, and that is when you understood that you were a sinner and that Jesus accepted your penalty on the cross, he died in your place to forgive you of your sins, and you surrendered your life to God and received Jesus Christ as your Savior. In that moment, you were given a light from the Lord. In another place, Paul said about that light in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. How incredible is that? That the God who said, let there be light at the first of all creation, the moment you surrendered your life to Christ, he said, let there be light in you. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine in your life. It's so profound that the light of Jesus is in every follower of Christ. And so the question that I have for you is the same question that I ask myself on a regular basis is my light leading or guiding people to life change? Is my light that I know I have, I've been assured of that because I have the Spirit of God living in me, is my light guiding people 
to life change? Is this light within me shining out for others to make a difference in them? Am I, am I pointing them to Jesus because you and I were created to shine? You and I were created to stand out, to go against the grain, to look different, to believe different, to act different, to live differently from the rest of the world. We were not changed and transformed by Jesus to think, look, and act just like everybody else around us. Jesus said in Matthew 5.15, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. The light that the Lord has placed in your life is a light that is supposed to radiate to all those around you. Now, it's certainly not a dark room this moment. It's not dark, but there's still a match. Every one of us in this room can see this match. Even with these lights on, you're able to see this light. And Jesus said, look, nobody lights a light and then puts a basket over it. Nobody lights a light and then closes it up. I burnt my hand. <laughs> it would be silly, wouldn't it? To say, hey, the power's out. Let's light candles and you light candles and then you cover them up. It doesn't make sense. And the light that Jesus has placed in you is a light that is, that is supposed to shine and radiate out. It's more than just a metaphorical statement. That light within you is real, it's compelling, it's attractive, it's strong, and it is powerful. Sometimes that light within you is like a beacon that your light warns others of dangerous activity. Hey, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Sometimes your light is like a searchlight searching for people who are in need of Jesus. Sometimes your light just illuminates the way for other people in this dark world. But your light isn't about you. The light that you've been given is always to point and guide people to Jesus. It may be verbally, it may be through your works, but your light is not to shine the light on you. The light that the Lord has given you is to point other people to Jesus. And that's why I love it that we're having lake baptisms Sunday night. I think it's so awesome. Every time there's a baptism, it's like this light that points people to Jesus. When a person is baptized as a follower of Jesus, they're declaring to the rest of the world, I'm now following Jesus. A baptism is an awesome radiating picture of a person who has surrendered their lives to Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit hovered like a dove. God spoke from heaven and declared, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God and the Holy Spirit pointed people to Jesus through his baptism and, and the glorious light of Jesus from heaven, or from God radiated and shone on him. In the very same way, when you were baptized as a follower of Jesus, there was a light that was radiating from your life. Now, granted, we're not like E.T. with glowing chests, right? We're not this glowing orb that everybody can see, but our lives ought to be so different. And not in a judgmental, haughty way, not in an arrogant way, and not in a prideful way, but in a way that we looked at in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, that we're not the most important person in the room, that we're humble, and we're constantly pointing people to Jesus. So if you've not yet signed up to be baptized, by the way, drive across London Bridge. We'd love to meet you at London Bridge Beach tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Now, if you're like me, you might be saying when you read this passage, hey, we were created to shine like stars in the universe. Sometimes I don't feel so shiny. Sometimes I don't feel so bright. In fact, sometimes I feel dim. You know, it, some of you might agree with that. Yep, he's very dim. He's a dim fella. And sometimes I feel like I'm definitely not pointing people to Jesus. 
this past week I was in the dugout and uh, I was disagreeing with the umpire behind home plate. All of this is happening in my head, right? Every pitch that looked like a strike to me, she called a ball, right? Disagreeing. There's some were too high, some were too low, inside and outside. And I'm just like watching this going. I'm like, this ump is crazy. She's blind. There's no way she's calling these plays correctly. And finally, on the outside, I look at the other coaches that are in the dugout with me and going, are, is she making the right calls? Is she calling these? Am I, am I just seeing these things correctly? That looked like a strike. This is terrible. And as soon as I said that, I immediately felt the light that I'm supposed to have get a little bit dimmer. Right? Instead of that light that says, hey, she's doing the best she can. She's a high school senior. She's doing the best she can. You know, instead I'm like, eh, she just doesn't understand the game of softball. Right? And here's why I felt that dimming in my heart. Because grumbling reveals a lack of faith. Verse 16, Paul said, do everything without complaining and arguing. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Grumbling reveals a lack of faith, or another way to say it, grumbling dims the light of Jesus in my life. When I grumble and when I complain, it dims the light of Jesus in my life to those around me. In verse 16, Paul said, do everything without complaining and arguing. He's in house arrest. He's chained up inside the house and he's telling them do everything without complaining and arguing see as a follower of jesus when we grumble and we complain about things that we disagree with we are dimming the light of jesus that other people can see in our lives grumbling actually reveals to the world that we really don't believe that god is sovereign or that god is in control Grumbling reveals to the world that we are not dependent upon God to carry us through the difficult situation that we're facing. Grumbling and complaining reveals to people around us that we really don't believe that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. If you've ever walked into a movie theater, I, I love the whole Marvel series, the Avengers series, I love all that. Go and watch a, a movie what you enter into is a suspended belief. You know what's happening on the screen is not real, but you still get excited about it. You, you might cry for a sad movie, you might cheer for a happy movie, but you watch a movie and the story and the emotion moves you. Why? You suspended your belief. You know there's no such thing as Superman, but when he rose back from the dead, you were pretty darn excited about it. You suspended your belief, and I think what happens sometimes when we grumble and sometimes when we complain, it's as though we enter the stage where we're suspending our belief temporarily that God is in control, that God is going to work all things out for good. So let me ask you, is your light pointing people to Jesus or do you complain and grumble so much that people actually wondered if you have stopped trusting in God? So a few raise your hand questions, bear with me, deal with it. If you don't like it, don't vote for me. <laughs> raise your hand if you know somebody that grumbles and complains a lot. Raise your hand if that person is you. Raise your hand if that person's your spouse. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so the Bible tells us that we all stumble in many ways, right? And I'm convinced that this little grumbling and complaining sin is more pervasive than the sin of lust among the churches in America today. We grumble and we complain about everything in the church world today. And that dims the light of Jesus. It causes us to lose our effectiveness in leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
We complain when our food is not cooked right. We complain when the ump has bad calls. We complain when the price of gas goes up. We complain uh, when the car in front of us is an idiot and the driver behind us is a moron, right? We complain about the music of young people and we complain about the music of old people and we complain about how young people dress and we complain about how old people dress. We complain about worship styles and we forget that David leaped and danced naked before the Lord and yet we complain about worship styles. Uh, we complain about our spouses and our children. We complain about our jobs. We complain about traffic, schools, and the government, and the mail when it runs late. And we complain about Amazon when they don't deliver that package on time. <laughs> we complain daily. We complain on a regular basis. We grumble on a regular basis. And what that says is we really don't believe that God has promised to guide us, to bless us, to protect us, and lead us. It dims the light of Jesus in our lives, and I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. So how, how do we keep on shining? Well, the answer's here in verse 16. Look at what Paul wrote. Philippians 2, 16, hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to the word of life. See, the application of God's word produces joy. When we apply God's word to our lives, it produces great joy in our lives. Week after week, you hear our, uh, the teaching team say this. If we read God's word and apply God's word, he will change our lives. If we read God's word and apply God's word, we will experience life change. You hear that every single weekend. But if we want to hold firmly God's word, we need to understand that there's more than just one way of getting God's word inside our hearts so we can apply it. So I'm going to ask you to help me out with this illustration. If you're able to, I'm going to ask you to hold up your Bible, just place it in your, your hand, kind of shoulder level, just like this. I don't want you to grip it. Okay, I just want you to hold it in your hand. Now, if you want, you're welcome to use that $3,000 iPhone 15 and put that Bible app up there. I would strongly discourage you from doing that at this moment. If you want to be involved, you can reach under, grab a Bible from underneath the seat in front of you and use that. But place that Bible in your hand. Don't grip it. Now, if you're sitting beside somebody that has their Bible raised... All I want you to do is reach over and take it out of their hand. That's it. Reach over, take it out. Was that difficult? That wasn't hard to do at all, was it? It was very easy. There are five different ways that we can actually get a better grip and apply the word of life to our lives that I want to share very quickly with you. And we're going to be able to use our hand to count the ways, okay? The very first is the pinky finger, which is hearing the Word of God. Do you know that we remember about 10% of what we hear? So if all you ever do is for your growing in your faith is hear a sermon on the weekend, you're only remembering 10%. Okay, so if you say, well, I go to church, well, that's not enough to really hold fast the word of life, but it helps, right? It helps. The pinky still has helper, right? The next finger is your ring finger. What I want you to remember about the ring finger is that is your reading finger, okay? You got your hearing finger and your reading finger. You remember about 20 to 25% of what you read, you actually remember, and then we have the ring finger, the middle finger. Sorry, I'm averse to saying middle finger in church. Yeah, you have your middle finger. <laughs> that middle finger stands for studying, studying God's word. We remember about 35 to 55% of what we actually study, okay? So we got three fingers right now. We got what we hear, what we read, and what we study. And the index finger or the pointer finger is memorizing how much of what we 
uh, memorized do we remember? 100%, right? 100% of what we memorize, we remember. So there's four different ways that we have to get God's word into our life if we're going to apply it. And the thumb is the thumb of meditation. Meditating on what we read, meditating on what we hear, mixed up those fingers, meditating on what we study, meditating on what we memorize, will do what? Will give us a firm grip on the word of God. You see, if you're drifting in your life and in your relationship with the Lord, and if you're always bouncing around, you're, maybe you're hearing or maybe you're reading, uh, maybe you're not applying God's word all the time. When you begin to meditate and think about the sermon and you begin to meditate and think about what you've read, when you meditate and you think about what you've studied, when you meditate on what you've memorized, you are holding fast the word of life then what's going to happen next time you feel like complaining and arguing is Philippians 2, 14 is going to come to mind because you've memorized it and you're going to say, do all things without complaining or arguing. Right? God has called us as followers of Jesus to hold fast to the word of life. Now, is the word of life referring to scripture? No, nope, the word of life is referring to Jesus how do we hold fast to Jesus? Through God's word. So I want to encourage you as a follower of Jesus Christ, as you continue to grow in your relationship with him, if you want that light to shine, if you wanna shine like stars in the universe, if you wanna be the type of person that draws other people to Jesus through your words, through your actions, through the way you live your life, if you wanna make a difference on this planet that's going to echo for all eternity, get a firm grip on God's word. Understand that he loves you. He cares for you. He gave his life for you. And he promises to lead you, to guide you, protect you, and to lavish you with his unfailing love. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this this life that we have been given through being born again, through being changed. Thank you, Father, that we've been able to uh, surrender our lives over to you. And God, we thank you for the work that you are doing. Lord, I pray that you would continue to use me to shine like stars, but God, use our church family to shine like stars, to point people to you. And Father, we pray that you would help us to stay out of your way. We know that sometimes we cover up that basket. Sometimes we cover up that light through our grumbling and through our complaining. And Lord, we repent of that. We tell you that we're sorry. And Lord, we ask that you would keep on changing us into the image of Jesus. Father, for, we're grateful for the work that you're doing. We ask that you would continue to work. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.